Well, hey, everybody. Come on, who's good? You good? I know God's good. Come on, fist bump the person beside you and tell them today is going to be a good day. Come on, tell them today is going to be a good day. Come on, now look on the other side of you, your second choice, and tell them you need a good day. Come on, tell them you, you need a good day. Day. Well, we are kicking off a brand new teaching series today that I'm really fired up about called Holy Spirit Unlocking the Mystery. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but it would be a miss today if I didn't take a minute just to acknowledge how awesome our Mother's Day was last week. If you are here, come on, can we give it up for all our moms and all that God did? And uh, I want to honor this lady right here in the front row that preached fire last week and just so thankful for you and your humility and uh, how much you love the Lord and how well you love me and my family. Uh, Girl, we go together like peanut butter and jelly. Come on, somebody. Which one's the peanut butter and which one's the jelly? Come on. Um, hey, listen, uh, I want to I wanna do this. Where is Lindsay Sasser? Where is she? Um, there you are. Hey, uh, stand up for a sec. Um, so the Lord uh, like spoke to me really prophetically when you were singing that song. And uh, he told me that you have a really pure spirit. And he's really proud of you. And he delights in you. Um, <laughs> And uh, man, just so incredibly cool. Well, we are uh, now kicking off this series, and I'm really glad that we are uh, unlocking the mystery. I think there is a lot of confusion on the topic of the Holy Spirit. I think there's a lot of misrepresentation, maybe some even some fear. And here's what I know, that typically we are afraid of what we don't understand. When we lack understanding about something, it's very easy to get distant because we're afraid of it. And so what I'm praying is that in this series that God releases some keys. Come on, say keys. Some keys to us so that we have actual biblical understanding when it comes to this very important topic on the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is going to be our theme verse For this series, and it's important that we get this because something is happening in the early church that really is a representation of what is happening today. 2,000 plus years later, this is still happening today. And so Paul is on his missionary journey, and Luke is recording. He is the one that's actually writing down. We have the, the book of Acts because he is a doctor, but is taking a detailed account of what is happening in the New Testament church. Once Pentecost fell, what God was doing as a result of the fullness of the gospel. And so Paul is on his missionary journey, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, come on, say Corinth. This is the reason why we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Paul wrote these letters to this church at Corinth. Now, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. Come on, say Ephesus. This is why we have the book of Ephesians. Ephesus is a city, and God established a church there. So Paul wrote the book, the letter of Ephesus, of Ephesians to the church of Ephesus so that he could encourage them. And he found some, notice this, disciples. Come on, say disciples. Now, the reason why I need us to camp there for a second is because it's important for you to hear this. In charismatic circles, it's automatically assumed that disciples represents born-again believers, that these are people that acknowledge that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. No one gets to the Father except through him. They heard the gospel, boom, they get saved. They're radically transformed. But that is not necessarily true of this context because it is like Luke to talk about disciples or to use that word at times to represent people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But we have to do some research on the word belief. Why? Because not all belief is saving faith type of belief. 
James says, listen, hey, it's really good that you believe, but even the demons believe and they shudder, right? So we've got to understand what is going on. And I'm not going to get into today, was this what Paul was addressing or was it not? The reason why I have a hard time believing that Paul was addressing born-again believers is because of the question that he asked them. When he says, do you have the Holy Spirit? Here's the deal. For Paul to ask a believer, a born again believer, if they had received the Holy Spirit would be contrary to everything else Paul taught about the Christian life. In fact, Paul says in other places, you cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit. So it seems weird then that Paul would ask a question that would not really give clarity as to what he's asking. Now, here's the deal. We'll get to this in the next few weeks. I don't want to go there today because regardless of whether they were truly saved or they were people that believed in Jesus but had not yet repented and put their faith in him, regardless of that, verse 2 is still true and is important for you and I to understand. Paul said to them, did you receive? Come on, say receive. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now look at their response. And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Paul sees these people on his journey. He says, hey, 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 hey. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Their answer might shock you and me, but this was common at this time because the person of the Holy Spirit was a very confusing topic. And so Paul is asking them a question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Their response is, no, we haven't even heard whether or not there is a Holy Spirit. Why is that so important? Because I believe that is where a lot of Christians are today. There is so much confusion on the Holy Spirit. There's so much hesitation on the Holy Spirit. And so I'm believing that in this series, God is going to unlock some things for us. He's going to expel some lies for us so that we can experience the fullness of Jesus Christ. If that sounds like a good idea, right now is a good time to give him some praise. Come on, give him praise like you're excited to be in church. But, but notice the subtitle is Unlocking the Mystery. Can I just tell you that God is not mysterious in a way that he does not fully and joyfully reveal himself to us. He does not make himself to us a mystery that we've got to figure out. God wants us to know him. Come on, say know him. God wants us to taste and see that he's good, to experience the fullness of his nature. God delights in that. He wants us to experience him. How many excited that God wants us to experience him? Come on, that he's not distant, that, that he's not trying to say, hey, figure this out. No, he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can experience the fullness of Jesus Christ. Come on, say the word with me, say key. No, no, say it like you mean it. What, what, what does a key do? A key unlocks doors. A, a key gives you access to rooms that you otherwise would not have access to. One time, my beautiful wife, she locked us out of the house. Come on, somebody. We are in the car, and I'm trying really hard to be a godly husband, but I was having an off Tuesday. How many of you with me? I was frustrated, so we were having a conversation. Come on, somebody. And I said, babe, why in the world did you shut the door without first checking if you had keys? At which point, she didn't even answer my question. She says, give me your wallet. And I'm like, girl, I ain't falling for that. You ain't getting money right now. You just locked us. No, she goes, give me your wallet. I said, why do you need my wallet? She goes, I need a card. And in that moment, I realized she was about to re reveal to me her inner ghetto. Come on, somebody. <laughs> like, I, I, I was about to see something, and, and I was a little bit nervous. Like, I felt like we were doing something wrong. And I'm like, no, no, no. I said, so I gave her my Costco card. I said, what are you going to do? She goes, I'm going to go get in the house. And she, like, slams the door. She begins... Boom, she pops open. Listen, I felt like less of a man. Come on, somebody. Honestly, here I am feeling like I should be doing this, and she is schooling me. She comes back, grabs the keys, throws the keys at me. She goes, there. Okay, you know what's interesting? 
we own the house. But because we lacked a key, we were kept from accessing something that was rightfully ours. And can I tell you that I think this happens a lot to Christians today. There is more that God wants for you. There is more revelation, more power, more joy, more peace, but you're lacking some understanding. You're lacking some keys that give you access to the inner courts of God. If you believe that, come on and give Jesus some praise. And so what I want to do in the course of this series, is I want to reveal some of these keys so that we can get access into places that we have otherwise not been able to access. And I believe that God has got a word for you. Listen to me. He wrecked the first service. Oh, come on. You better buckle up and get ready because I believe that God's got a word for you. And I believe that God wants you to leave different than how you walked in. I believe God has not said, come to a sermon, come to a church service. He said, come to me, because I've got a word for you. I want to do a mighty work in you. But if we're going to experience the Holy Spirit in the way God desires us to experience him, then we've got to unlock some things that have been a mystery up to this point. Here's the first key that you need to understand, that the Holy Spirit is personal. Write that down. The Holy Spirit is personal. What do I mean by that? The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is not a dove, although one time in Scripture he was revealed as a dove. He's not an it. He's not a distant concept. He's not a power. He's not a force. The Bible very very much clearly tells us that he is a person. And can I tell you why that's important? Because if you don't see the Holy Spirit as a person, you will not develop a personal relationship with him. Because people don't have relationships with its. They don't have relationships with possessions. But they do have relationships with people. Now look at how Jesus in John chapter 14 now begins to describe what is going to happen. What you have to understand is John 14, John 15, John 16. He talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. Why? What is Jesus doing? This is considered his farewell discourse. In Jewish culture, when somebody was coming to the end of their life, they would gather the family and they would pass down truth to the grandkids, pass down truth to their children, and they would remind them of what is important. They would remind them of, hey, continue in the truth, study the word of God, pray to God, find your satisfaction in God. They would pass down to their family the most important things. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, so he's prepared the disciples. I'm not always going to be here, but there is good news. Come on, say good news. In verse 16, he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Come on, say forever. How how many are thankful that Jesus doesn't just save us and leave us? That Jesus saves us, he redeems us, he fills us with his spirit, he pursues us every single day, he equips us with the word of God, he gives us all grace to abound to us so that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, we will abound in every good work. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and then boom, he's gone. Because physically he did leave. Physically, he went to the cross. Three days later, he revealed himself through the power of the resurrection. And then he goes and he ascends to the right-hand throne of the Father. So he very much physically is not in the room. But he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So how could he fulfill that promise? He's saying, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit. And so it's an interesting thing. Well, who is the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you asked me. Verse 17, look at how he says this. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept, notice this, him. Come on, say him. Doesn't say it. 
cannot accept him. Why? Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Notice Jesus never says it's an it. Jesus never says the Holy Spirit is a force. Jesus never refers to the Holy Spirit as an object. Every time he references the Holy Spirit, he references him as a person. Come on, say person. See, see, I, I, I love this chair. Come on, somebody. This chair is my office chair. It, it is, it is my, my favorite chair. I love the way it looks. I, I love it stylistically. I love it functionally. When I sit on this bad boy, it supports my back perfect. It was like this chair was made for me. I love this chair. I love that it doesn't have a cushion so it can't get stinky. Can I get an amen? Can we just preach up in here right now? Because I'm getting ready to listen. I love this chair. I, I, I absolutely love this chair. I, I love these boots. These are my favorite boots. People ask me all the time, are those cowboy boots? I say, no, they are Chelsea boots. Come on, somebody. Yeah, come on, somebody representing right here. Listen, Chelsea boots doesn't make me any less of a man. Can I get an amen? I, I love these boots. They're comfortable. They're maybe the most comfortable thing that I put my feet in. I love to wear them. I love the way they look. I love the way they look with different color of jeans. I love these Chelsea books, uh, boots. Uh, I, I love this Mac. Come on, somebody. This is the first Mac that I ever had. It is heavier than sin in Jesus' name. But, but I remember when I went to college, I was a PC guy. I know, I worked on the dark side. Come on, somebody. But I, I, I was a PC guy, and so my mom bought me a computer for college, and within three months, y'all, that computer crashed, that PC crashed. So they sent me to a guy that said he could fix it, and when he told me the price, it was worth almost what I actually paid for the computer. I said, I can't afford to do that. I'm a very poor college student. Come on, somebody. So he said, well, I do sell used laptops. So I find a PC laptop. It was very inexpensive. There is a reason why it was inexpensive, because it was cheap and it didn't work. Come on, somebody. I had it for about three months and that sucker broke. I went a third time, got another PC. That thing broke too. And then finally, the Lord sent me a messenger from the kingdom of light. And he said, have you ever tried Mac? Because once you go Mac, you'll never go back. Come on, somebody. And, 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 and I, 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 well, like, I don't know if we can afford it. He's going, no, no, no. Think about it as an investment. And I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll get this investment. I'll tell you what, it changed my life. Come on, somebody. It changed my life. And I clearly began to realize that Macs represent the kingdom of God. PCs represent the kingdom of hell. Just like dogs are anointed and cats are cursed, it all became very clear to me in that moment. But here's the deal. I love the chair. I love the boots. And I love the computer. But as much as I love them and as much as I use them and interact with them, there is something that I do not have with them. It is a relationship. Why? Because people don't have relationships with possessions. They have relationships with people. And so often you are programmed by the lies of the enemy to see God as a person, God the Father as a person, God the Son as a person, but we see God the Holy Spirit as an it. And I need to tell you right now, he is not an it, he is not a force, he is not a dove, he is a person and he desires a personal relationship with you. So what makes a person a person? Is it that I'm alive? You're alive? No, because trees are alive, right? They are living things. So what makes a person a person is a person has a soul. Come on, say soul. This is why the Bible says, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? Why did Jesus come to save my and your soul? And hundreds of years of biblical study has revealed to us that the soul is made up of 
three very important things. This is what makes a person a person, and the Holy Spirit possesses all three of these things. We see it in Scripture. Write the first one down. He has a mind. Come on, he thinks. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit thinks? Have you ever been living your life and you realize, I don't even know what I'm thinking? Have you ever been looking at somebody who dressed kind of crazy and thought, what in the world were you, come on, say it, what were you thinking? Listen, so often we're going through life, but we're not really thinking. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit has a mind and he's thinking that he has a purpose and a plan and he's making himself known to you and me. I love Romans chapter 8 starting in verse 26. Paul says it this way, we begin to see the mind of the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Have you ever wanted to pray, but you didn't know what to say, come on, just put up your hand. Have you ever had a burden to lift somebody up in prayer, but you didn't know what to say? Have you ever been trying to minister to somebody, but you didn't know how to encourage them? Good news, God who lives in you, the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead you in all truth. Can I get an amen? But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 27, and he who searches hearts knows, notice this, what is the mind of the Spirit. Come on, say those four words with me. Mind of the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. How many are thankful for that? He intercedes for you and me according to the will of God. Man, I am thankful for that. Jensen Franklin always says this, we have become so open-minded that our brains are falling out. Come on, somebody. Let me just say, that is really just different language for our culture is jacked up and needs Jesus Christ. Are you in agreement that the world needs Jesus Christ? Listen, when they begin to say that abortion is okay and it's not murder, we need the Holy Spirit to remind us that abortion is murder, that God is the author of life, God is the presenter of life, God is the good giver of life, and we need need to be reminded as the church that every life matters. It doesn't matter how small because every life was created in the image of God. Or, or what about marriage? We live in a culture that's trying to redefine what marriage is, saying that you can have two men or two women and it can be holy in the sight of God. I need you to understand that is biblically untrue. It is incorrect. God created marriage right the first time. We have no authority to redefine it. So the Holy Spirit helps us remember as the people of God what the Word of God says. Or what about when you're here and you don't even want to be here because of what you did yesterday? And the enemy, the accuser of your faith, is saying, you don't even deserve to be in church. Don't you lift your hand. Don't you shout out amen. Don't you act like you really love Jesus and he's there condemning, condemning, condemning. And we need the Holy Spirit to remind us that God has always loved us and there is nothing that we can do that will ever separate us from the love of God. That he'll make all grace abound to us so that at all things, at all times, having all that we need, we will always abound in every good work. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he doesn't change, then and his love for us cannot change because that's how good our God is. But we need the Holy Spirit to help us think like God thinks. Because it's so easy to go about your life and you're thinking, you're just not thinking what is true. And the Holy Spirit lives in you to guide you into all truth. The Bible says it's like this one woman, she was trying to figure out the texting game, the art of texting, and she didn't know what LOL meant, but she would sign off with it in every text, every email, every time she was writing something to somebody, she would always 
end it with L-O-L. And on one day, she writes her son, David, who is in college, and she says, David, I've got some bad news. Your great aunt passed away, L-O-L. And he writes back and goes, why is that funny? And she says, it's not funny, David. What do you mean? And he says, Mom, L-O-L means laughing out loud. And she says, oh my goodness, I just sent that to the whole family that's grieving. I thought it meant lots of love. Come on, somebody. Listen, it's not that she wasn't thinking. She just wasn't thinking clearly. Church, I need you to understand that the person of the Holy Spirit, he is not an it. He has a mind. And his job is to help you think the way God thinks. And we need that help every minute of every day so you can understand now why the enemy would try to keep you away from the person of the Holy Spirit so he can keep you from thinking the way God thinks. We've got to pay attention to that. Here's the second thing. He has a will. He desires. Come on, say desires. He, he, he desires. Do you know that he has a will for your life? I'm not sure if you know because you really didn't holler back. Do you know that he has a will for your life? Do, 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 do you believe the Bible? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Do you believe that for your life? Do you believe that even when you've jacked it up, God still has a plan for your life? I believe this is so much true. This is the reason why we're doing this Holy Spirit series. You say, Pastor Sean, what do you mean? I didn't plan to do this series. The Holy Spirit planned to do this series. I had a different series in mind called Our God, What We Believe and Why It Matters. And it was an eight-part theological series. We were going to study the nature of God and why it matters in our personal walk with Jesus Christ. And so that everything, the campaign, all the design, everything was done. And the Holy Spirit said, no. I want you to do this series on the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he has a will, not just for my life. He has a will for your life. He has a will for this church. And Sean Cooper is not in charge of this church. Jesus Christ is in charge of this church. Amen? Amen. So, so I answer to him when he says, no, shift gears. I shift gears. Why? Because he's leading the charge. I'm not leading the charge. This is why I'm going on sabbatical for six weeks this summer. It is really important for pastors to rest. Listen, a healthy pastor equals a healthy church. Come on, somebody. And I remember the Lord said, hey, you're going to take a sabbatical. And with that is some fear because I'm like, no, if I'm not here, this is going to fall. If I'm not here, this is not going to get done. If I'm not here and God says, are you leading this ship or am I leading this ship? And so the elders were in agreement, hey, you need to take a sabbatical. One of my overseers said, Sean, you need to take a sabbatical. Can I tell you how blessed I am and how blessed Elisa is and how blessed we are as a church? Most pastors take a sabbatical because they're burning out or there is a crisis of faith. God has appointed this sabbatical so that we can rest, so that we can continue to strengthen the marriage that we have, so we can continue to grow in the Lord, and that I can get fresh revelation from God for this church to lead us forward into the future that God has for us. So I, I'm trying to lead by examples. I don't care if I'm the number one guy under Jesus leading this thing. I need to lead by example and take a break. Why am I taking the break? Because the Holy Spirit led me to. Let me ask you a question. What's the Holy Spirit leading you to do right now? Let me ask a different question. What plans are you, you making for your life that you haven't first consulted the one who created your life? Teenagers, what plans are you making right now about your future and you even haven't asked the one who holds your future in the palm of his hand? Can I tell you that when you seek God, he'll bless you? When you seek God, he'll pour out his blessing and his favor. And I promise you this, I have learned this from experience, that when I do it my way, it might get done. When I do it God's way, it is 100% blessed all the time. And if you can attest to that right now, is a good chance to give Jesus praise. Come on, give him praise. All right, here's the third one. E emotions, he feels. 
So, so God is trying to help me think what he thinks. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He's trying to help me desire what God desires. And he's also trying to help me feel what God feels. It's really important that we get this. How many have heard the verse, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart? It almost sounds like, hey, if you follow Jesus, he'll give you whatever you want. Can I tell you that's not true? Do you know what that verse means? When you put Jesus first, your desires begin to reflect God's desires for your life. The more I surrender to Jesus, the more my desires begin to reflect what he wants for my life. I need a better amen. amen. But he also has emotions. He feels, look at Ephesians chapter 430. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Come on, say grieve. grieve. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say grieve. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So in other words, he doesn't just feel, listen to me, but how I choose to live my life impacts what he feels. Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What this word means is to grieve a loss of intimacy with someone. When someone that you dearly love passes away, why you grieve is because you have lost intimacy with them. They are no longer physically here. You have lost that intimacy with this person that once was here, and now you are separated from that person. So what Paul is literally saying is you need to live in such a way that you're paying attention to the decisions you're making. Why? Listen to me. Because sin will distance you from intimacy with God. Your relationship is still there, but there's a lack of fellowship. And so often, I'm going to be, oh, I'm going to be honest in this series. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit in here big time. Listen to me. A lot of us, we're living right here. We're living right here. We feel so distant from God. And I need you to know, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But sin will put division between you and God. We all sin. The question is, are we repenting of it when we do? Are we turning to Jesus? Are we real enough with God to say, God, I didn't make a mistake. I sinned. I sinned. The way I choose to live my life matters so much to the Holy Spirit that what he feels is impacted by the decisions that I make. I need you to get this. God doesn't expose people. He exposes sin. And he exposes sin as an expression of his love for you. The Bible says he is a jealous God. He will not allow you to share yourself with another. another. Why? Because if he was okay with being number two, it would imply that there is something greater than him and there is nothing greater than him. Only he is going to satisfy you. Only he is going to fulfill the deepest longings of your heart. So we keep searching for things to fulfill us. Here's why. Because we're not finding fulfillment in him. So Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve a loss of intimacy with the God who lives inside of you. He hasn't gone anywhere. Can I get an amen? amen? But isn't it true that sometimes because of sin, it feels like he's a mile away? That can change today. I want you to write this down. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, we can know him personally. How many are thankful that we can know him personally? Come on, church. How many are thankful that we can know him personally? So here's the second key. Come on, say key. key. Here's the second key. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit is safe. He's, he's safe. Oh, he's powerful. Come on, somebody. But he's safe. He, he does supernatural things, but he's safe. God said, hey, don't use the word Weird. 
Don't just tell them that I'm not weird. I want you to tell them that I am safe. Have you ever known somebody who's safe? Like you just love to be around that person because you felt safe around that person. That's the way I felt about Grandpa John, my dad's dad. What's crazy is to this day, I have one memory of him. One. The memory is that we were in a farmhouse, my dad's homestead where he grew up. We were in the kitchen and Grandpa John was sitting on the chair and I was up on his lap and I remember looking down at his hands and they were massive. And I remember thinking, it's amazing how somebody so powerful is also so gentle. And do you know what I felt in that moment? Man, I am safe with Grandpa John. I am safe. So many people in this room, that's the last thing that comes to mind when you think about the Holy Spirit because you have seen the Holy Spirit misrepresented so many times. Man, if you go onto YouTube, come on somebody, you will see all kinds of crazy things that have nothing to do with God. Sometimes we've been around people who misrepresent the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people will teach things. I'm going to challenge even our mature believers in the house. I'm thankful that you're mature in the Lord, and I am thankful that you desire the deeper things of God. But what I've seen as a pastor is a lot of times, even what mature believers believe aren't necessarily biblical. And if it's going to be an authentic move of God, it's got to be biblical, amen? Where are all my parents at? Come on, somebody. Put up, come on, my parents at, listen, you, you, you know when you, like, are going somewhere in public and, and you stop the car and you tell your kids, now you better behave, come on, somebody. You, 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 you better not act like you ain't got no home training. How many of you know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I, we'll tell our kids, do not go into their house and tell them that you are hungry. You know what I mean? It, it's like amazing that when kids get around other people, they think that they can get away with things that they normally can't get away with. And, and it's like they're testing boundaries. And I remember the first time they're like, oh, I'm going to do it because dad won't spank me with these people here. I'm like, oh, you got me totally wrong. Not only will I spank you, but it's going to be more fun because people are going to watch. Come on. <laughs> I, I'll spank your kids. Come on, somebody. Listen to me. You don't spank out of anger. A pastor told me that if your discipline doesn't end with a hug, you're not done. But can I tell you, parents, that if you are not disciplining your kids, you are keeping them from experiencing the holiness of God, is what Hebrew says. You are keeping them from experiencing an expression of God's love. He disciplines those he loves. We need to discipline. So sometimes you got to give them a pop, pop. Can I get an amen? Is it okay? I know that's not PC, but it is gospel. And I would rather preach gospel than what culture says is acceptable in Jesus' name. Can we just get, get amen with it? So, 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 so he's, he's, he's safe. And I love what John 16 now, two chapters later, Jesus continues in his farewell discourse, and he says this, that when the spirit of truth comes, notice this, he will guide you into what? All truth. No, 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 no. say it like you mean it. Come on. All truth. He's going to guide you into all truth, and he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. How many are thankful that he even sees past your horizon? He sees what your eyes cannot see. He knows your future. He will speak to you things that are to come if you would just trust him and get under his counsel. Can I get an amen? Verse 14, and he will, come on, say it with me, glorify Wow. He will glorify me, Jesus says, for he will take what is mine and declare it or make it known to you. Can I tell you 
the power of a worship gathering? Oh, come on, when you're worshiping, like five minutes ago, you didn't even want to be here. But then you experience the presence of God. What is happening in the spiritual? Can I tell you what's happening? The Holy Spirit is taking the things of Jesus and he's making them known to you. He's revealing his majesty. He's revealing his goodness. He's revealing his character. And when you see God, you inevitably begin to worship him. But he says he's safe. Come on, say safe. He, he, he will glorify me. So I've got four things I need you to write down real quick. We've got to get these four things. These are going to safeguard us as a church. No, 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 no. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. I want to be known as a spirit-filled, Jesus-centered church. Spirit-filled and Jesus-centered. So if we're going to grow in maturity in the deeper things of God, then we need to understand the parameters that God puts for us to know and live in his good, safe character. I need a better amen. amen. All right, here we go. His actions will always glorify Jesus. Write that first one down. His actions will always glorify Jesus. Listen to me. If a so-called gathering, if Jesus is not the central figure of that gathering, it is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never takes the spotlight. Go back to the verse. He will glorify me. Come on, say glorify me. Jesus says, I have come to glorify the Father, but the Holy Spirit is coming to glorify me. So if you're part of a gathering that makes it hard for you to focus on Jesus, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never do anything that will make it hard for you to encounter Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing. His instruction will always be biblical. His instruction will always be biblical. I can't tell you how many times people come up to me and say, hey, Pastor Sean, God is telling me this is what I need to do. I'm like, I can just dispel that real quick. God is not telling you. That is not God. That is a spirit, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Here's, and he, how, how do you know? God spoke to me. Here's how I know. God has made his will very clear in the word of God. So if the Holy Spirit speaks, he will always speak according to his word. He will never contradict his word. So people who do crazy things in the name of Jesus, you just got, all you got to do is measure it against the word of God. And you know that isn't the Holy Spirit. I see a lot of Christians, listen to me, saying that they're living a spirit-filled life. But their behavior does not reveal Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will never reveal anything to you that doesn't perfectly line up with the word of God. Listen, can we just thank him that he gives us such grace and protection that we can't even jack it up if we just get underneath his hair? All right, here's the third one. His approach will always be gentle. His approach will always be gentle. Like, like I, I can't tell you how many times, like, I think people kind of, like, are fearful of the Holy Spirit because, like, they've seen people, like, convulsing, uh, you know, and, like, foaming at the mouth, and it looks like the Holy Spirit just kind of comes over a person and, like, physically slams them to the ground. Can I, can I just, here's, here's the deal. Why we have to be careful with this is because we take on a nature of God that is not revealed in the scripture. We do not need to look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit to identify the Holy Spirit's character. We need to look at Jesus' character. Why? Because he comes to glorify Jesus. Here is my question. Can you point to one passage in all of scripture where Jesus forced himself on someone? I promise you, you can't find it. Listen, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit will move in your life to the degree that you make room for him to move. If it's forced, it's not love. If it's forced, it's not worship. 
His character will always be gentle. Here's the last one. His agenda will always be pure. Notice it's the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Do you know what holy means? It means to be set apart. Set apart. That's what the word holy means, to be set apart. In other words, to be different. Can I tell you what the Holy Spirit's job is in your life? To help you live a set-apart life for Jesus Christ so that when the world looks at you, they see Jesus. His agenda is always pure. So the Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is safe. And here's the third and final. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Come on, say God. Um, I was praying this morning. God woke me up early. And he said, you and me, we're not done. He said, downstairs. And he changed my third point. Now, it was always the Holy Spirit is God, but where I was taking it was completely different. I want you to know what he told me. And I need you to hear it, church. That if we don't, and this is my concern for the church, okay? This is my concern for you. As your pastor, I have a concern. These are some of the burdens that I lay down before the Lord as I pray for you. My concern is that if we don't understand that the Holy Spirit is God, we won't submit to the authority of his conviction. You know those moments when God reveals sin in your life and in my life. And we just keep living as if it's just a suggestion. Paul ends a really powerful thought with a verse that I think can help us. He says this in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship, come on, say fellowship, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Can you go to that verse on the screen? Paul saying, church, I, I need you to understand something. This verse represents the Trinity in one verse and, and represents what each person of the Godhead does for us. He says, I, I, I'm praying that you would come to know the grace of Jesus Christ. Christ. And then I'm, I'm praying that you would come to know the love of God the Father. Like you would know his love to the point where you don't have to pretend with him. And you don't have to come to church and act like everything's okay. That you could just get real and transparent with God and say, God, I am not defined by the mistakes I've made. I am defined by my Father's love. I am defined by Jesus Christ. I am defined by your love for me. He says, Corinthians, Vertical Chapel, I want you to know the Father's love. And I think so often in today's world, in today's church, we've experienced the grace of Jesus and we know the love of God, but we've never experienced true fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It's like we're, we're trying to pursue Jesus without the one who's necessary to help us pursue Jesus. He says, I want you to have this, this fellowship. I just got back from a men's conference. And I'm telling you, God broke me. Man, he broke me. 
It was in the very last session. And I'm like, God, I just, I feel like there's this distance between you and me. And I keep asking you to break it. I keep asking you to remove what it is that I'm feeling. Remove that gap. I want that intimacy. And boom, God just like revealed every conference I ever went to. And he showed me those moments when the pastor was preaching and there was an opportunity to repent. And he said, Sean, every time I've called you to stand up and acknowledge me, you never do because you're worried about what your staff will think. Because I'm the pastor. Culture says, I always have to have it together. He said, if you want me to break the blockage of intimacy, I want you to humble yourself before me. And when that pastor says, stand, I want you to stand. And I had this thought, oh man, I'll just stand and people will think it's just because I need to read my Bible more or I just need to pray more. And then the pastor goes, I'm not talking about if you need to read your Bible more or pray. I'm talking if you've got a dirty sin. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you my sin? Pride. No, 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 I'm going deeper. He said, you have been trying to lead this church without me. There have been moments and seasons that you have thought you can do this without me. You started to see a little growth and you forgot how much you needed me. When that pastor says, stand, are you gonna stand? And I jumped up on my feet and I went down to the altar and I didn't care who was looking because I knew who was worthy. And Jesus began to do a work in your pastor and he broke those chains. And I believe this. I will never be the same again because of that moment of repentance with the Lord. And I wondered as we start this series on the Holy Spirit, if we as a church could just get real with God. You know, that sin that he's been convicting us of and we keep displacing it like it's a suggestion. Listen to me, some of you, and I don't say it to condemn you, I just say it because it's what the Lord put on my heart. Some of you aren't married and you're having premarital sex and you want God's blessing, but God says, I won't pour out blessing on something that dishonors me. Some of you, you're over drinking. And you know it's wrong, and you've even felt the gracious nudge of God's love, but you've kind of dismissed it. I don't know what it is that you're struggling with, but here's what I do know. That every day I need to repent before the Lord. Every day I need to get honest with God. And I thought, man, we can't start a series and talk about the Holy Spirit without experiencing the Holy Spirit. And we come in here and we try to convince everybody else, no, I got it all together, I got it all together. And we go through those doors unchanged. And Jesus is saying today is the day that you repent. You don't put it off until tomorrow, you repent today. And I feel this in my spirit, I feel like God's just gonna restore what is broken. The response the first service was amazing. And I feel the spirit of God in here today. And I believe that he wants to do a work. I believe he wants to free people. I believe chains are gonna come off. I believe God is gonna restore the brokenness. And I'm telling you, it's gonna take your humility. It took my humility as a pastor 
in front of people that I lead to go, man, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And I'm tired of pretending. So if you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, to you, and there's something you know, I, I gotta repent. I gotta repent. Just right where you are, I want you to stand up on your feet. If there is something, just stand up. Yes, just stand up. Yeah, just stand up. And just say, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting real with you today. I'm getting real with you today. I, I'm standing up. I'm humbling myself before you. I don't want to play church. I don't want to pretend anymore. I need a touch of your spirit. God, you're convicting me. You're not condemning me. And the fact that you're convicting me means you're not done with me. Can I get an amen? You're, you're not done with me. You're not done with me. I want you to lift up your hands. I want you to say to the Lord, you're sorry. Come on, tell him, I repent. I repent. It means to turn. I repent. I turn. And I surrender my life to you once again, Jesus. I want you to say this. You're not just my Savior. You're my Lord. You're my Lord. You are God. And when you speak, it is. When you speak, it has authority to speak life into existence and speak stars and galaxies into existence. So when you speak to me, that you're gonna tear down the broken places so that you can make me alive in you. Tell him, I receive it, Lord God. I receive it. Listen, I want you right now to begin to lift up your voice to God. Don't pray just under your breath. Just right now, just begin to lift up your voice. Come on, everybody begin to pray. God, we just repent. Come on, tell him. I, I turn to you, God. Say, I am so sorry. And I ask for your forgiveness. I'm choosing to follow you, Jesus. Tell them, I'm not following religion. I'm not following vertical chapel. I'm following Jesus Christ. And you can take them. Tell them, tell them. You can take every broken place in my life and you can make it whole. Come on, tell them. Say, I believe it. No, 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 no. Say it like you mean it. Come on, I believe it. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill every single person in this room. Lord, you told me you are a rewarder of the humble. This house is full of humble people right now. And I'm asking that you would meet them exactly where they are. God, that you would reveal how awesome you are and how faithful your love is for each of us in this room. God, I thank you that you are faithful to complete the good work that you have started. Come on, tell them. I I'm thankful that you are faithful to complete the good work that you have started. And I receive it all. Come on, I receive it all. I, I receive everything that you have for me. In the matchless and all-powerful name of Jesus Christ, and we all shout it out. Come on, we celebrated God. Lord, we love you.